Right, well, hey guys, my name is Brian Osborne. I'm with Dr. Danny Faulkner. We're glad you're with us here today. And we are talking about Danny's brand new book, The Heavens, A Different View. And I'm excited to talk about this for so many different reasons. It's a gorgeous book, by the way. It really is just so well done. And you'll love just looking at it, much less reading the content. So we'll get to that here in a minute. But uh, first, just want to kind of mention me and Danny have a little bit of history. Uh, we are South African buddies. We toured through South Africa doing a speaking tour. How, when was that now? A couple of years ago? I think it's three years ago this spring. Three years ago. That's right. Yeah. 2000. Man, time flies. We had such a good time with that. Uh, so much just fun hanging out and getting to know each other, I think, a bit better and seeing different things, learning that uh, – Danny definitely doesn't like the door open and the air conditioner on at the same time. So be sure you understand that. Uh, but uh, and then just having a great time speaking and Danny being a goofball. Uh, I, I love it. Having so much fun. Dr. Faulkner is both smart and fun, which is a wonderful combination. And we had a great time. I know I did. I don't know about you, Danny. Uh, but uh, I had fun. Great time. Yeah. And so speaking of seminary there uh, and just uh, so many wonderful opportunities and uh and we went on safari together, got to see some very unique things. Danny went to sleep with lions, as you can tell uh, from the uh, picture here. Actually, we got a video of that. I don't know if you know that, Danny, but we got a video of when you decided to take a nap with the lion cub. And I think we've got that maybe queued up. Let's see here. Um, I'm here videoing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If somebody was petting me all the time, I'd probably fall asleep too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Papa, you sleeping with the lion. <laughs> oh. Shh. 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 <laughs> so what were you thinking at that moment? I was thinking of the song, uh, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. <laughs> I think I was humming it or something. I can't remember. <laughs> Oh man, that was, that was, so that was a great time playing with us. There was three cubs. Two of them were kind of sleeping. One was definitely sleeping, but one was active. He was up around all over the place. He was a hoot. Got some good photos of him playing. <clears throat> and I say, I mean, as we did that, I couldn't help but think about the new heavens, the new earth, and uh, you know, perfect creation, pre-fall, the post-fall when Christ returns. Getting excited about that. Uh, but that was awesome on so many different levels. And many good believers in South Africa. A great time connecting with them. But uh, speaking of believers, there are people popping on here on the channel. People from everywhere. Uh, people from Michigan, New York, the <laughs> uh, many different places. You guys are awesome. We're glad you're here. And uh, just wanted to kind of just kind of get the ball rolling with some of those memories, but also bring it back to the book. We actually, you have some pictures from that trip in the book. But before we get to that, Maybe just tell everybody, you know, what's the story behind the book? And we'll get to the purpose of the book as well. Well, you know, I, I've been an astronomer for a very long time, but I never really got into astrophotography. Back when I first got started, it would have required a 35 millimeter camera, special lenses, other equipment, which I didn't have. Film's expensive. Developing's expensive. So I just never got into it. Until about six years ago, I had a I got a digital SLR camera, and I thought, well, I can start using this. So I got a camera adapter for one of our telescopes we have here at the observatory at the Creation Museum, and I started taking pictures through the telescope. And I had to learn what I was doing. It's pretty quick learning, but I'm still learning a lot. And then I started taking um, wide-angle pictures just with my camera in dark locations. I did uh, one of those uh, pictures I did in South Africa there in uh, Kruger National Park at night. I included in the, in the book as well. Um, and my intention at first was to, to get some um, images that we could use to illustrate some of my articles that I've written, some of the books. Um, a lot of the really good images you want out there, you might have to deal with copyright issues, permission to right. use, and all those kind of things. So wouldn't it be great if we have a creation-based astronomy library? That was my original intent. Along the way, I found a couple of other uh, men, uh, Glenn Fountain in Georgia and uh, uh, Jim Bonser in Iowa, who are amateur astronomers, better f astrophotographers than I am, believe it or not. They really are good. Some beautiful and, pictures. Uh, yeah, they're very supportive of the ministry, and uh, they've been here many times. And I found out they had some pictures. I said, can you share them with me? Do you mind if I use them? They said, absolutely. <laughs> cool. So um, after I started doing that, I realized, you know, there's a possibility of a, of a coffee table book here. And I remember Tom Vail, uh, founder of, uh, you know Tom Vail, don't you? You've yep. met him. Uh, yep. He founded Canyon Ministries back in the 90s to uh, have a Christian experience on the Colorado River doing a raft trip for a few days or a week even. 
And um, we've partnered with him now for more than two decades, providing some of the staff to do this. And though Tom is retired from doing that, uh, he is um, still very actively involved. And about 15, 16, 17 years ago, he wrote a book called Grand Canyon, A Different View. You know, evolutionists use Grand Canyon of, of geology to explain, you know, millions of years. And well, we have a different view. And he had these beautiful pictures in there that uh, he and a few other people had taken, plus some essays written by different people. About five years ago, our colleague here, George Purdom, biologist, she went to the Galapagos Island for a week. And she wrote a book in the same series, Galapagos, A, a Different View. And okay. you know, and that one, the uh, Galapagos Islands is supposed to be about biological evolution. Well, I got to think of, well, why not do the heavens a different view? And so I began um, putting it together, collecting the images I wanted. We then, I wrote the essays in this one. And I want to point out the essays are not really long, but if you want to treat this like most people treat National Geographic and just look at the pictures, that's okay. You have my permission. <laughs> but I do have um, I do have essays that I wrote in there, bringing it back to uh, the Bible and to creation. I tell you a quick shout out before we move on. You mentioned Canyon Ministries, and you do a trip. I do a trip as well, different trips. But you do a trip every year with them, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if people, I'm telling you, they call that the rock star trip, because if you go on that <laughs> trip down the river, you're learning about the rocks from a biblical worldview, but also Danny's doing just so many wonderful uh, looks at the heavens through, you bring telescopes, right? I bring through. one telescope and some binoculars. You know, we I got a laser I can use to point things out because the skies yeah. are really dark there. The rocks tend to get in the way for some reason, but um, <laughs> we have some good campsites we go to, but you know, we build that one a little differently from the others. We call, there's one of the pictures, there we call go. it uh, geology by day astronomy by night and i kind of subtitle that if i can keep people awake um, <laughs> because it is a problem they were busy all day go if you can go back to that brandon that earlier photograph i took that one um i think two summers ago with 2020 i believe you can see the milky way there and you can see jupiter that bright star to the left of the milky way and to the left yep. of that is saturn just barely above i picked that one out because saturn just barely gets above the um, rocks there and that okay. light you see on the uh, on the canyon wall there that is um uh the the uh, direct illumination by the the waning uh, gibbous moon it rose while i was doing this i made a time lapse out of it and that moonlight creeps down the wall of the canyon so it's really cool the next photograph i think i took the year before that and it's a uh, at almost the same campsite not quite it's just up river about a oh, half mile maybe if that far again the milky way you can see the jupiter is on the right of the milky way it moved that much in one year's time uh, in the sky. And that's what something close oh. to what the Milky Way looks like. It's nicely framed at this particular campsite. We always try to st stop at one of the two campsites right there. It's in Marble Canyon, the upper portion, because you get a very good slot there to view the Milky Way, which is an amazing thing to see in a dark sky. Oh, it really is. I I've seen it myself being there. And I'm telling you, you guys who are watching, if you get a chance, if you can go on the trip, go to Kenya Ministries and uh, book a trip and you book it with any of the different speakers who go, but they're a Christian ministry teaching stuff from a biblical worldview. Danny does an incredible job of teaching. It'll be a lot of fun as well. You will love that trip. So you get a chance, you might want to book that and go down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, see the Milky Way, see the stars and have a rock star trip. Uh, it really is awesome. Uh, but uh, some of the other gorgeous pictures, by the way, I got to mention very quickly in the comments here, Danny, Justin Ernest says hi from South Africa. So, uh -huh. hey, but, hey, good to see you, Justin. Glad you're here. And by the uh, way, I might I might be uh, going to South Africa in a few months, late this oh, spring. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm talking to some people about having me back in there, and it'll be my fourth trip, and I'm chomping at the bit. I love South Africa. It's a wonderful They're going to let country. you back in? Yes, they are. <laughs> uh, I think I think Teddy's going to gonna pull, pull some strings for me. Somebody mentioned in the comments when they saw you lying with a lion cub, they said, okay, we see a stuffed Teddy. Now, is that a stuffed lion? <laughs> no, and, uh, it's, just, it's Teddy, a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and there's so we're talking about all these pictures and maybe we'll show a few more of the pictures. You kind of break down what's kind of going on in the pictures, but like, as you mentioned before, it's a great coffee table book. There's so much to look at, but also great commentary to go with it. But maybe as we go through some of these pictures, you can kind of break down what's going on, what's happening, what we're looking at. Oh, this is, um, <clears throat> I believe that is either by Jim or Deb Bonser taken at the uh, 20, 17 um, uh, total solar eclipse. I was in um, Oregon, just east of the Cascades. They were, I think, in Grand Isle, Nebraska for that one. That's a beautiful image you can see there. The star Regulus is on the left. You're seeing the uh, corona. Uh, that's close to what it looked like to the naked eye or maybe through binoculars. You can see magnetic field um, and the streamers in the corona. 
that's I tell you when you see these pictures of of total solar eclipses, keep in mind that no photo can do justice to the experience of actually being there. Your right. eye can actually out, outdo the camera because you can see the corona, but you can also see the prominences, which are overexposed here. If you take a short exposure, you just get the uh, prominences, not much of the corona. I've got a, a photo of that in, uh, that I took at the eclipse uh, that's in the book as well. But it's a remarkable thing, and we, we have a whole chapter just on that one solar eclipse uh, that took place. And we got another one coming up in uh, two years, in April of 2024. Oh, that's the uh, Diamond Ring. I think that was by Deb Bonser, <laughs> Jim Bonser. Uh, I'm not sure. I have to look it up now. It could be Glenn Fountain, the other fellow. But um, uh, at the very beginning, the very ending of the eclipse, uh, the first little bit of the photosphere of the sun to peek through at the end, or the last little bit to peek through at the beginning, um, gives you that, that look of a diamond with the ring being the Corona and promises on the edges. You're not supposed to look at that. It's very dangerous. Uh, I was shouting to people to look away as we counted down. And uh, both my wife and my son at the uh, 2017 eclipse said they saw it. And I, I'm a bit jealous, but I'm also uh, jealous of my excellent eyesight. And I don't want to do anything <laughs> to jeopardize it. So I'll satisfy myself with photos. Don't look at it, folks, at an eclipse. It's not, it's not, it's not wise. Hey, and while we're looking at this, Danny, could you maybe explain from uh, just a biblical perspective, from an apologetics perspective, how we can actually even have these eclipses? Like what makes it possible to have a total eclipse and why is that really kind of point to design? Oh, yeah. Well, the, uh, the, the sun is about 400 times larger than the sun, uh, than the moon is. And it's also about 400 times farther away. So if you have something that's that much larger and that much farther away, those two compensate. The farther away something gets, the smaller it appears. So uh, both the sun and the moon, even though dramatically different distances and sizes, it subtend about a half degree in the uh, sky. So when a, uh, the moon passes in front of the sun, you get um, coverage just barely. And it makes for very spectacular um, total solar eclipses. If the moon were a little smaller, or a little farther away, we wouldn't get um, eclipses at all. Uh, or if the uh, moon were larger or closer to us, they would be uh, over total quite a bit, not nearly as spectacular. It also makes them rare. They occur on, on a given location on Earth about once every four centuries. So if you see one in your life, you probably are either very lucky or you have planned accordingly to go someplace to see one. And it's the, the most beautiful thing I have ever seen in my life. It, it far outstrips everything else that I've ever experienced. And they're all very different. Having been to two of them now, I can tell you that they are very different. If you think you've seen one, you've seen them all, you haven't. You've seen one of them. They're all <laughs> truly remarkable. So it's the most beautiful thing in all of creation, and yet it's very rare and and almost almost couldn't happen. And you can look at this, the 400 and 400, and think, well, that's just a coincidence. But I ask you, how many coincidences are you allowed to have before you begin to realize that maybe this stack of coincidences aren't coincidences at all? I think it is a design implication. Uh, God could have, I mean, the, the world could be very different from what it is. We wouldn't see these at all. But I think God in his kindness to us allowed us to see some of the artistry that he's so good at. And on top of that, it allows us to study some things about the sun that cannot be studied any other time, as it turns out. It's not just a beautiful spectacle, but people who specialize in uh, solar astronomy actually um, wait for total solar eclipses for certain things they can study only then. Uh, that is amazing. It kind of reminds us, too, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, well, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. Their purpose was to be for signs and for seasons. Uh, and light on the earth. And, and light on the earth, right? They give, so really, they're a galactic clock in a lot of ways as well. And of course, those eclipses act as timekeepers or special events that point to different things. So, I mean, there's definitely that connection. There's no doubt about that. Uh, by the way, Ryan mentioned on here in the comments, he said that picture, I think, of the diamond ring around uh, in an eclipse there. He says, that is the most beautiful thing except for my wife, which is very wise, Ryan. Good on you. All right. <laughs> Good for plugging that in there. Oh, man. Uh, and so let's keep going at some of the other pictures, too, and kind of maybe you can give some commentary on those as well. As well. Now, by the way, people, we won't give you all the pictures. All right. There's so many more in the book and they're all incredible on different levels. But just a few that kind of get your appetite up for this and, and then it can kind of walk us through them. OK, this is the Pleiades star cluster. I really like it a lot. Um, it's very recognizable this time of year for us in the northern hemisphere. It gets high up around midnight. Um, 
It's uh, some people mistake it for the little dipper because it has kind of like a little dipper sort of shape, but it's a lot smaller than a little dipper. A lot of people have seen this in the sky and never, never really knew what it was. That blue uh, glow you see around some of the brighter stars, that's nebulosity caused by dust particles. Light from these stars are scattered off of that. Um, the, uh, you can't see that except with a very, very large telescope. I've never actually seen it, but a long exposure photograph can pick it up. The, um, uh, the, in Japan, they call this Subaru. And if you put an oval around the six brighter stars there, you will recognize the Subaru symbol pretty nicely. <laughs> uh, so that, that's, that's the name. That's where the name of the, of the auto company comes from, from the name of the, the Pleiades star cluster. It's a beautiful cluster. And again, visible uh, all night this time of year. And, you know, it's mentioned three times in Scripture, twice in Job, once in the book of Amos. And um, both times, uh, all three times, it's mentioned in conjunction with Orion, which is my one of my two favorite constellations, because they're close together in the sky. And in uh, each case, they're talking about uh, God who had made all of these. You look up in the sky, you see Orion, you see the Pleiades, you realize that God made these things and we're nothing compared uh, to the majesty and power that God has, because we can't make anything like that. I love it in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 1, where it's talking about God made the sun and the moon and the stars. And at the end of verse 16, it says, and he made the stars also. Yeah. And, and we're talking about trillions upon trillions upon trillions of stars that he made by the power of his word. And he made them also. Like it's nothing for God. Just a mic drop from him about showing his power, even by his spoken word. Yep. That's, that's and, and to me, it's a little frustrating because I understand the Hebrew, it's even more sparse than what it says in the English. It simply says the stars also. <laughs> we have to fill in the, uh, the the subject and the verb of the sentence, but it's understood. So it's almost like, oh, yeah, Danny's going to wonder about that. So I better let him know here. So he puts it in there. But yeah, I, I specialize in stars. I'm a stellar astronomer, you see. <laughs> and uh, so I, I really, I really, I really like stars a lot. Well, let's keep going. I think we have a couple other pictures, too, if I remember correctly. There we go. Yep. Yeah, this is the Andromeda Galaxy. This is one of those things we like to look at in um, for here in Northern Hemisphere, autumn skies. Uh, you can see it with your naked eye in a dark location. It looks like a little fuzzy star. Uh, if you put binoculars or telescope on it, you'll see more. But uh, when you do look at it with a telescope, all you're, and even with the naked eye, all you're seeing is the very center of that thing, that, that nucleus. It extends several degrees across the sky, and to um, uh, to get a photograph like this, you got to take a pretty long exposure in a telescope to, uh, to do that. And um, you can uh, see it's got a couple of satellite galaxies to the lower right of the center. There's uh, M32, and uh, to the left there's uh, NGC. I can't remember the name of that one, but it's a uh, this is the closest galaxy Andromeda is closest galaxy of any size to our own. Uh, the galaxy is probably a little over 100,000 light years across. Our own galaxy is two. This galaxy is a few, um, a couple of million light years away from us. Again, the closest galaxy of any size are some smaller galaxies close to us, like Andromeda has those two little satellite galaxies. The old Milky Way galaxy has a couple of um, couple of um, satellite galaxies as well. And um, when we do our stargazer nights here in the autumn, uh, I usually put one of the telescopes on that, and then I can I can adjust the ca the telescope so you can see the center of the Andromeda galaxy. Remember that little satellite galaxy to the lower right? You can see it too if I orient it just right wow. for you. They look like little smudges. They don't look like much the uh, through the telescope. You know, our eyes can collect light for about a tenth of a second. The camera can do it as long as you want to keep the camera open and do it. So that, that is the picture you saw there. Probably is a, probably an hour's worth of exposures that wow. uh, one of the one of the two amateurs uh, astronomers who work with me did. That's phenomenal. It really is. And then while we're looking at while we're thinking about the galaxies, maybe you could just kind of throw in some points real quick about how the features of galaxies really uh, point to a young Earth or a confirmation of that biblical understanding of the age of the Earth and the universe. Well, one thing about uh, it's a spiral galaxy. You saw that kind of a, a kind of a swirly pattern in the middle, and uh, uh, those are spiral arms. They don't show up so well as they do in some other galaxies, and uh, that's been a discussion for better part of a century, what spiral arms are and how do they persist, because these things in the galaxies are orbiting around under gravitational attraction, presumably, 
And the, there's another one. You can see this. This is M33. I think Glenn Fountain took this one. Mm -hmm. And you can see the nucleus there and uh, things are orbiting around. But things near the middle are moving, uh, orbiting more quickly than things on the perimeter. So as you go from the center to the outside, they're, they're taking longer to orbit around. So if you had a spiral pattern, after a few rotations, that spiral pattern should smear out. So the question is, why do spiral arms continue to persist? Mm -hmm. And uh, after just a, oh, a billion or two years, there shouldn't be any spiral arms visible, yet these galaxies are believed to be over you know, 10, 12 billion years old. So why do we still see spiral, spiral structure? And in my, my lifetime, they've suggested at least three different mechanisms for this. <laughs> and it's, it used to, back in the starting yeah. in the 60s, it was what they called spiral density wave theory. And it's kind of uh, been morphed into something else. Uh, for a while they were talking about, uh, now they're talking about dark matter stirring it up. Before that, they were talking about those little companion galaxies stirring it up. Uh, the, the fact they keep changing the, 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 yeah. the, the answer tells me that probably the earlier versions didn't work any more than the current one is too. So it's still, a, I think, an outstanding problem. But if the universe is uh, quite younger than billions of years, uh, then that's not a problem at all. So I think spiral structure perhaps indicates that the universe is not nearly as old as people think. Maybe not directly thousands of years old like we think, but it's more consistent with thousands of years than billions of years. And if you guys kind of like that sort of understanding and that commentary and that really that apologetics that Danny's talking about, I encourage you to go to the website, answersingenesis.org. Uh, Danny's got tons of articles uh, giving you great uh, insights into uh, how God's Word is confirmed by our observations of science and astronomy. He does a wonderful job with that. Multiple books, by the way, on the website as well. Uh, Danny's done an incredible job on. And, and really and truly, when you get down to it, science repeatedly, rightly understood, confirms the Bible again and again and again. And, and really, if you're not familiar with our ministry, Answers in Genesis, our passion is really ultimately about defending biblical authority. It's not focused per se about winning a, a debate on one particular issue, although we do defend on these issues of the age of the earth and the earth's origins and, and you know evolution not being true and God's creation being fact. We do defend those things, but our purpose in defending those things is defending biblical authority and the gospel rooted in that authority. And that really is our passion as a ministry, and it bleeds into everything that we do. And we talked about earlier. We looked at just the, the beautiful uh, creation around us. We saw the pictures. We'll see more here in a second. That really showed that there is a designer. Uh, designer had to make it like this, to make it this beautiful, or the, or the moon to be where it is to get the eclipses. It points to a designer. But just pointing to a designer is not enough. We need to have that biblical revelation about where we come from, made in God's image. And also that biblical revelation tells us why there's beauty in the world from our creator, but also why there's so much brokenness. We see beauty and brokenness. Why? Because on well, Genesis 3, in God's word, it tells us man's sin bringing death and suffering into this world. And that sin wrecked everything. And we all descend from Adam. Therefore, we're all sinners by nature and by choice. And we all need saving through the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And so the defending of biblical authority, defending that biblical revelation is really to point people to how God's word is true. It's right about all things. It's right about history. It's right about the present, and it's right about the future, and it's right about salvation through Christ alone. And so you'll see that bleed throughout the book, bleed throughout our resources, but I want to kind of plug that in there because that is the heartbeat behind all that we're doing. And then maybe after my little diatribe, <laughs> uh, I, I just, that's, that's going to bleed out to everything I say and do. But also, I think we got a couple more pictures, and it would be about time to wrap up. So I know there's a few questions through the chat. I'm trying to follow some of those. I don't have a lot of time for a lot of the questions. But, yeah, keep going. Danny, go I, for it. I, I took this one myself uh, through the telescope of the uh, lunar eclipse about four years ago, I think. It was a cold night in January. But uh, it's a total solar, lunar eclipse. Uh, the middle of the eclipse is down. Uh, the shadow is down below. The uh, above is near the perimeter. That is during totality. That's about a 12-second exposure right there, by the way. Um, can we you get to that? I like to show the arc arc photo that we have. That's, oh yeah, that's I one of my that. favorites. That's a that's a really cool photo. There it is. Oh my goodness. Uh, Jim Bonser from Iowa did this one. Um, Jim and Jim and I went down to the um, got special permission. Went down to the uh, arc one night. Spent about half a night there. We wanted to get some astro photos with the arc as a backdrop. And anybody who's been to the arc will recognize this. It's out at the um, near just to the one side of Mzara's uh, restaurant, looking at the bow fin there. And uh, Jim 
position this so the North Star is right over the top of the bow fin. This is a half hour exposure that he took here. And um, it's a beautiful photo. I think a great make a great jigsaw puzzle. We could pro probably market at the <laughs> Ark for sure. But uh, the stars will make a, a complete uh, revolution uh, like that around the sky every uh, sidereal day, which is four minutes shorter than the solar day. Of course, you throughout the night, you can't get but a part of that because it's going to be daytime for part of it. But uh, that's just really, um, really an impressive uh, image that that. Uh, that he did there. And I think it's one of the sharpest ones uh, in the whole book. One of my favorites. It, it the, is absolutely it, awesome. And we need to emphasize that's real. That's a real picture. Yeah, it is. It's not, it's not been, uh, it was it was put together by a bunch of exposures that he took the technique, but it's not been altered in any way to, to fake anything. That really is a real image. Uh, I mentioned, Jim, I want to share with you uh, when when I he got his first copy of this book a few weeks ago, um, he emailed me, he was very excited. And uh, I'll read I'll read part of what his email said. Uh, he said one of the one of the primary reasons I like to image the night sky is to be able to share what the heavens declare about power and glory of God with people. Mm. This book will reach far more people than I ever could on my own. I am so grateful. Words fail me. Mm, that's awesome. And, and, you know, that that's not just Jim's uh, spirit and attitude about this. this is mine and also Glenn, the other major photographer, uh, contributed to this. We want people just not to see the pretty pictures, but we right. want them to be drawn to the, the, the creator behind those pictures and the fact that that he cares for us and has provided a way for salvation for us. That's that's what it's all about, folks. That's not just pretty pictures. That's nice. That's wonderful. But we need to go beyond that. And that's our sincere desire at Answers in Genesis and also for putting this book together. I absolutely love it. Uh, what a great note to end on. Uh, for people wanting to get the book, Danny, where should they go to be getting the book? Well, we sell it here there you <laughs> at go, the right? Museum. You can also right. go online to on our website, uh, AnswersInGenesis.org. Look at the store. Just just type in Heaven's a Different View. It'll come up pretty quickly. Yep. And um uh, if they can catch me here sometime on the road or at the museum, we'd be happy to sign them for them. It's, it's always a delight to do that for people. Well, that's one. Well, Danny does a lot of shows for the ministry, the uh, planetarium show, or not the planetarium, but the uh, the night skies going out to doing the viewing of things through a telescope. You have different programs throughout the year. He does speaking at times at the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, does a lot of stuff for the ministry. We love them here. Uh, and, we, we, um, we, we do live shows, too, in the planetarium. I'm, I do those. That's right. Yep, yeah. that's right. Do plan. Okay, very good. Uh, and so you can definitely check online about Wendy's doing a particular show. Maybe plan your trip to come to the Creation Museum or the Ark Encounter. Wendy's doing a show. Kind of make that part of what you're doing. There's so much to do while you're here. Someone mentioned earlier, there's a comment about where do you find more information about the, the rafting trip. If you go to Canyon Ministries, I think it's .org, but just Google Canyon Ministries and go to their, their website. There'll be a lot of information there about that. But go to AnswersInGenesis.org for the Heavens Declare or the Heavens A Different View, which is Danny's new book. You'll find it there. Uh, you can find it other places as well. Plan your trip to come to the museum. Get Danny to sign it. And uh, it'll be just a great thing to have around the house. Great coffee table book. But also, as Danny so well said, the purpose is to declare the glory of God, his power, his truth, point to his great salvation provided through Jesus Christ, his son. And uh, we are so glad you joined us here today. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And Danny, thanks so much for taking time and sharing with us about the book. See you guys.